Oh boy. Well, they're getting closer to not being able to fight immunity now because with this this new variant that's coming out that's out already and spread, it's the flu basically. That's that's gonna that's gonna kill their narrative. So I'm anxious to see how they change that. But oh boy. But anyway, it is the life we live, right? This is what we face every day. Uh, it's interesting the times, but Joshua chapter eleven. We'll get right right into it here. Now these chapters, some of these chapters are going to go a little quicker because some of them are reviews. So I think in Joshua chapter 12, I, I may only have maybe one or two sermons in Joshua chapter 12. And as, you, as we move forward, because we're going to talk about Caleb and how he fought the giants and a few of those other things. So, um, you know, it's, um, we'll, we'll move faster through some of those chapters, I believe. Because a lot of them are review and names of things, and not that they're not important, but to to our study, they won't be as important um, as what we if we were studying something specifically historically. Uh, in, in that case, they won't be as I shouldn't say they're not as important, but they're not as relevant for what we're doing uh, in going you know chapter by chapter and verse through by verse through there. Uh, you'll see that you're, you, as we move forward that there's a lot of review that's going to take place of. Uh, you know, today you're going to see like the end of, they're going to they're talk about conquering the whole land, but then you're going to spend the next four or five or six or seven or ten chapters where they actually explain how they did it. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing, but he's going to explain how they defeated everyone and how they did this and into specifics. Like today, we're going to talk about slaying giants and that God will not fail thee. And when we look at that, we're not going to look specifically on how uh, of how the giants were slain in that sense, but the concept of it. And then later on, when we pick up in a few chapters, we'll pick up where Caleb fought the giants and just that spirit that Caleb had and what he did and everything like that. So we'll get into specifics of the giants and things like that um, as we move forward with that uh, in the chapters uh, coming up here. But um, anyway, it is a... Uh, a blessing to be able to take the Word of God and go through things and God to teach us things along the way. And how, you know, I don't think a preacher can rightly help people to apply things to their life that from the Scriptures unless they are afflicted. Uh, you know, I've noticed that since God allowed me to go through certain afflictions and things that that you're a, I'm able to be more sensitive to the, the things that you go through and the challenges that you and I both face and how these things apply to our lives, how even this chapter here applies to things that we're going through. And that's not an accident. God knows that. And one of the, one of the most important things that a pastor could do, listen, I, I'm not what you would call an academic preacher or in, in that sense. I've met those that are just teachers, basically. They can teach you things, but do they help you to apply those things from the scriptures to your life? There's guys that can expository preach and such in such a way, and they're very good at it, but do they help you to apply it to your life? Like, how does it help you? The Bible is not just some textbook in that sense to be taught. It is to be lived, right? It is to be applied to our everyday life. It is all sufficient for everything that we need. So, so in other words, you, you don't need to just hear um, line upon or text, line upon line, in that sense, text upon text, and not know how that applies to your situation. A pastor has to take the Bible and and pray through the Holy Ghost to have the power of God and the discernment to be able to help you to apply that to what you're going through right now in your life. Because the Bible is always relevant. The Bible is always necessary. It's always needed for where you're at. By the way, the, the most amazing thing about it is it, it isn't just where, where let's say, uh, Scott's at today. Or it isn't where just Dan's at today, but it's where all of you are at today. Where there, there ought to be something that you take away from Bible preaching every week. There ought to be something that you take away for you, right? That it will help you to live this life for Christ. And if preachers don't preach that, and that's not, and they're not applying the scriptures that way, then they're really not feeding their people the way that they need to be fed in order for them to grow. Because in order for them to, to be sustained and to be, to be strengthened through whatever they're going through. Now, the second thing about that is you have to receive it and you have to obey it. If you don't receive it or obey it, you're not going to grow either. You can resist the Holy Ghost. 
and you cannot receive the message that God has for you. And you can fight that and you can, and you can, you know, you can try to shake off the yoke, so to speak, of what God's trying to teach you. And then you won't grow either. You, you won't grow the way God wants you to grow. And a lot of people do that too. They won't receive the comfort of the Holy Ghost. They won't receive the comfort that God wants to give them. They reject that, and when they do that, when they fight that, and they don't receive that comfort that God wants to give them, then they stay miserable. I'll tell you that, you'll stay miserable. Or if you, if you think the lesson's for somebody else and not for you in that sense, right? Then, then you know, you'll, you'll stay miserable. But God knows how to find his man or woman. He knows how to find them, and he knows how to, he, he knows how to apply that to their lives and their hearts. The Holy Ghost knows how to bring that down to us and help us to be able to understand it. And by the way, even to the smallest child here, those that, that are old enough to have some understanding, they're able to take that, and they're able to grow and learn. And see, this is not, we don't just come to church uh, and meet as a church on Sunday. We don't just do that out of, uh, we don't do that out of a formality. We do that because, because number one, Christ commanded it. Number two, because we want to grow and be edified in our faith and, and take that with us uh, during the week and be able to be strengthened by it. And that's what preaching is, is, is designed to do. And uh, that, that's what it's for. It's to edify. You know, it's to build you up and, and it's to correct you and instruct you. So anyway, Joshua chapter 11, verse number 21. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, in Ashdod there remain. Now you'll remember later on that Goliath is raised up from Gaza, from Gath, and from Ashdod, from those areas, from the Philistines areas, that, they are ra that, that Goliath is raised up. And then Goliath's brothers, he has family, he has brothers there, and they're giants too, and they're going to be in that land. Why? Because they weren't taken, they weren't uh, killed. They were still around, and you'll, you'll find that David destroys the remnant of those giants. David, a type of Christ, right? So Joshua roots him out, Caleb kills him, Joshua kills him, and then there's some left over when David comes up on the scene and David's going to fight that beast, right? Uh, Goliath is that 666 beast. Uh, his dimensions and everything else, he is that antichrist beast. And he's there, and David is going to rise up that line of the tribe of Judah. David is going to rise up that type of Christ, and he will destroy the remnant of them, the rest of them. And that's a picture of, of our salvation. That's a picture of our enemies falling. That's a picture of what God does through Christ, uh, our Joshua or our David, our King of Kings, in that sense. So that's an interesting thing to understand. So that's where those giants end up, and you'll find them later. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land, had rest, the land rested from war. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us to rightly divide it today. Use it in our hearts and our lives. Lord, if there be one or two here not saved, that they'd come to Christ and to know him which is to know life eternal. And Lord, I, I pray, Father, that those that are your saints, that you'd strengthen their hearts, build them, make them stronger, grow them. Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, number one, God does not destroy the smoking flax. I say that because many times as God saves the worst of our enemies for the end to destroy. And those enemies are within us, by the way. Those enemies are not without for the most part. They are within. Those enemies God does not destroy right away, and I'll explain that to you in a little while. Isaiah chapter 42, verse number 3 says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Then in Matthew, if you're marking in your Bible there, Matthew chapter 12, verse number 20, here's the New Testament reference to that. A bruised reed shall he not break. Amen. A bruised reed shall he not break. And smoking flax shall he not quench till he sent forth judgment unto victory. Look at that. 
This says, the Old Testament says, he shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Truth is victory. Do you see that? Because look at the New Testament. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. Truth is victory. Holding on to the truth means victory. Right? Anchoring into the truth is victory. It doesn't always feel like victory, but it is. It is victory. God said it was. God said it was. Holding on, right? Holding on, right, to our most holy faith right? Uh, holding on uh, to that and holding fast our profession without wavering. That's holding on to the truth and that's victory. Amen. I like how the New Testament explains the Old Testament for us. Don't you like that, how it clarifies that? Today in our, in our study when we, with our children today, when we look at Enoch, the life of Enoch, in our, in our children's class, say, well, when we look at that, we're going to talk about how the New Testament explained things that we didn't know in the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews goes back and it explains. The book of Jude goes back and explains more about Enoch than Genesis explains Enoch. Think about that for a second. It goes back and it explains all of, of, of what, what's important about the life of Enoch. That's the amazing thing of the scriptures. They're just unbelievable, aren't they? They're amazing. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. And his name shall the gen in his name shall the Gentiles trust. That's what the Bible says there. And when I mean unbelievable, what I mean by that is in the flesh, you couldn't understand it. We, we can't even imagine how anything could come about like that, right? That's why we, we have faith, because we, we don't have sight. When it comes to that, we live by faith. We see this book and the, and the miracle of it, and it takes, you have to have the Spirit of God inside of you to believe it. You, you can't believe it any other way. Amen. Amen. It's God's Spirit that brings that truth home. So that's a better way to say that, to correct myself in that. And it's unbelievable in the flesh, but it isn't in the Spirit, right? Okay, God is not in the business of crushing His children. He loves them, and he knows just the right amount of affliction and pounds of pressure to place on them for their good. Lamentations chapter 3 says, but though, in verse number 2, But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. You see, God is merciful and he loves his children greatly. So while, they're, while they were storming through Canaan land and they were battling, there was a reason why God didn't throw the giants at them right away. He didn't throw them at them right away. There's a reason for that. God knows your fears, by the way. He knows them. He knew the Israelites' fears. He knew Israel's fears before they went into the land. And their fears were magnified by their unbelief. And so will your fears be magnified by your unbelief. They will be great, big, huge giants. And it's by your unbelief that they get bigger. Right? They get bigger. Not every, you know, understand this, that not every condition of anxiety in a person's mind is unbelief, but some of it is, some of it you and I cannot change. Some things that go on in our brains, we can't, we can't make them stop. But isn't that the lesson of life God teaches us? There are some afflictions and some trials, you can't make them stop. You'll go through them for years, and you can't make them stop. But what you can do is believe God through them. Do you understand that? That's the difference. I can believe God through them. I can trust the Lord through those things. But it doesn't take the affliction away. And if it was real, you know, shouldn't it, if you, shouldn't it take it away and it all be gone? No, you should trust God through it. God never told you he was going to take it all away from you. He said sometimes he will, and other times his grace is sufficient for you. And you're just going to have to believe him. You just have to believe God. 
And I know some of you are thinking right now, you're trying to tell me that all I really need to do through this most grievous time of my life or whatever it is I'm going through, that all I really need to do is believe God's promises and just trust Him. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Actually, no, that's what God's telling you. But yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Isn't that a simple answer? You know, a lot of counseling can be settled real quick like that. You just look at people and tell you just need to believe God. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not hurting, you're not going through things. God doesn't discount that. But what God tells us is you got to believe God. Right? You see, I, you can't change some things that go on in your life. You aren't in control of those things. You aren't. There are things that you cannot change in your life. Why? Because you're not God. That's why. And you can't. You can't stop some things. You can't change some things in your life. So what are you supposed to do then? You're supposed to believe God. Yeah, but it'd be a lot easier to believe God if he just took it away. <laughs> well, that's not going to happen. So, so, so you, you know, that, but it, by the way, it wouldn't. You'd find something else you wouldn't believe God about. Amen. Because that's human nature, isn't it? That's how we are. We're, we have hearts full of unbelief at times. What you and I are commanded to do is to trust God in the dark, to trust God when we are going through these difficulties. They're facing those giants, and they're going to go cast them out. God didn't give it to them on their first journey when they first came in. In fact, God knocked down walls for them. God did a lot of things for them. Why? Because they were babies. They were babies in warfare. You see, God built them up and taught them how to fight. That's what God does to his children. He builds them up, and he teaches them how to fight. I'll tell you something right now. Spiritually speaking, I know how to fight a lot better now than I did five years ago. Oh, you better believe I do. And that's not by my own understanding. It's by God's. But I know, I know how to fight a lot better now. I understand some things. Right? God taught me some things. Through some things. To trust God more. And to believe on God's promises. And that you'd be surprised, preacher, what you can endure if you have to. Amen. Some people look back and they look at things and they say, I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this. Well, it's going to be the grace of God. Somebody asked me one day, how in the world did you ever get through this, God? Amen. It was God. It wasn't me. It was God. It was, it was a grace that God did it. Like I, I literally, <laughs> it was the Lord. That's how. Like to continue preaching and to continue moving and continue trusting God and preaching the gospel and being faithful to God and continuing to help others out there that needed it and preach the truth everywhere and, and continue on in depression and discouragements and being down. The Lord, that's how. Right? You know, Israel could have defeated their enemies right away, but they gave in to fear at the outset. It is not a sin for you to have fear. It is a sin for you to give in to fear and to be ruled by it. It is a sin if you are derelict in your duties because of fear. That is a sin. If you stop being faithful to God because you're afraid or you have fear in your heart, then that is a sin. Because you haven't obeyed the Lord. Joshua is recording here the great victory, but this victory takes us back to the wilderness wanderings. Turn to Numbers chapter 13. You know, they're facing the giants here in Joshua chapter 11. And they're going to root them out of the land. They're going to kill them and destroy them. Finally. Caleb's going to remark down the road later, he's going to say, you know, 40 and 5 years. <laughs> Caleb was like, getting held back as long as he could, right? He's going around them. I don't think a day went by when Caleb didn't think about those giants and that mountain that God was going to give him. Be like, man, I wish I could go in there right now. But I already know that God told me I ain't going in there for another 40-some years. But I'm not going to forget about it every single day of my life, that those giants are in my mountain. And as soon as I get the opportunity, and, and he said he stood before Joshua later on in a couple chapters after this that we're in today. He says later, he goes, 40 and five years, man, I've, I've been waiting a long time for this. And he said, I might be 80 years old, but I'm just as young as I was the day that I was here the first time. You give me that mountain because I'm taking it. Amen. 
Numbers chapter 13, verse number 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land where thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Well, if you remember right, God knocked down the walls. Remember that? The cities are, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Oh, man, we saw the giants there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. Caleb's like, the character Greatheart, right, in Bunyan's, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, right? He's like Greatheart. He says, let's go up at once. He stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we, we were in their sight. Now that's not true, by the way. Because the Bible reports to us that those people, the fear of God was in those people, and they were afraid of the, of the Israelites because they were afraid of the God of the Israelites. They were already afraid. They spent 40 years wandering around. They were already afraid of them. Right? You see, they allowed fear to control them. They allowed the size and stature of their enemies to be greater than their faith. Their God was little, and their giants were bigger. If you and I follow our fears, then we will surely pay the prices for it. We must apply faith to our hearts and believe God's promises above all else. See, it gets worse because in Numbers 14.30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up. And they brought up an evil report of the land, right? And in verse number 33, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak. They talk about who they saw. They talk about what, they, what, what was going to happen to them. What happened? God didn't let them come in, right? So what they accused God of was not true. God had not sent them up for failure. God had not sent them to be devoured by the land or by the people. But the Lord loved them and would give them the victory, but they chose unbelief and they were defeated by themselves, not the giants. Because how can you win if you make God your enemy and you speak against His goodness? How can you be victorious without faith? Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. You see, they misrepresented God. How many times have you done that? How many times have you accused God of bringing you out to destroy you? When God is trying to bless you, you accuse him of destroying you. When the Lord has commanded you to exercise faith, you exercise unbelief. You see, they charge God foolishly in their warfare. We're guilty of the same thing when the fear of our enemies is greater than our fear of God. How can you defeat the giants in your life when you don't believe God's promises? So then the Lord allowed them to wallow in unbelief, and all those that did not believe died in the wilderness. But their children, moreover their children, the picture of the new believer in Christ, and men like Caleb and Joshua, they would go into the land and they would receive the promise because they believed God. Whatever your trial is this morning, God is not trying to crush you with the giants that are surrounding you. God is proving you and trying you to know what is in your heart. God is showing you how great He is. What these Israelites did not understand when they said, they were grasshoppers in the sight of those giants is this. They always were grasshoppers. You and I never were anything great. Amen. 
Why did we ever faint in our hearts that we were something great? It's God that is great. It is God that stands up and fights for his people. It is God that strengthens his people. It is the power of God's might. When you put on the armor of God, you're to put it on in the power of his might. Or like David, you wouldn't prove it. You wouldn't be able to lift it up. Ephesians 6 says that you put on the armor of God in the power of his might. When your fear is great, your faith is weak. When, your fear, when you allow your fear to overcome your faith, you're not walking by faith. You're walking by sight. And you're wanting to feel something from God or you're wanting to see something from God, but you're not wanting to believe God. You're not wanting to believe Him. You're not trusting His plan and His way. What these Israelites, they didn't understand. They were already grasshoppers. They were never big. They were never going to go into that land and defeat those giants by themselves in their own power. They never were. And neither were you. You're never going to get the victory in this life on your own, walking in the flesh, trying to achieve some kind of victory in the flesh. You and I can't do that. I don't care how much intestinal fortitude you have. I don't care how much drive you have. I don't care about how much initiative you have. I don't care how much you want to do right. Without the power of God, you ain't doing nothing. And that's just the truth. You won't do anything. You'll, you'll stumble, you'll fall, you'll trip until you look up. And you get strength from above. And you get wisdom from above. And you get growth and knowledge and understanding. And you start seeking God with your whole heart and quit whining about not, not finding Him. God is there. He's right where you left Him. He's right where you walked away and got cold from God. He's right where you turned your back. He's right where you went off and went your own way and had your own plans. He's the same place he's always been. Like Spurgeon said in, a, in, a, in one of his sermons, he said, God's right where you left him at. If you got cold in the prayer closet or you neglected the prayer closet, you'll find him there. That's exactly where he is. If you neglected him in Bible study, if you neglected him searching the scriptures, you'll find him in the scriptures. He's right there. Right? God is right there. If you've neglected walking in sanctification and you've walked away, God is right there. Amen. God is right there. He hasn't gone anywhere. You have. God, hasn't, God didn't drift far away from you. You drifted away from him long before he ever did anything like that. Amen. You'll get a lot farther if you'll just blame yourself and trust God. And you just trust the Lord. But see, it's not just a blaming of yourself. Because I can, I can beat myself. I can, I can mutilate myself. I can, I can punish myself. I can hate myself. And I can do all those things. That isn't going to help me one bit. Why is that? Because self is nothing. That's why. Self is overrated. Right? People are saying, I want to work on your self-esteem. I want to work on this. I want to... You know what you need to work on? Your Christ-esteem. That's what you need to work on. Self-esteem in that sense is overrated. By the way, you trust too much in your own self, you're going to slip on the ice. Isn't that right? Isn't that how that works? Right? You take for granted sometimes every day that everything is going to work out well for you and you have everything planned and, 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 and you, you, you take, for instance, Lee, that your knee will never be bad and then one day you wake up and your knee's bad, right? Then you have to think, wow, how'd that happen? Right? But we take those things for granted, don't we? We don't lean on God and, and, really, and really trust Him. We just assume some things, right? We assume some things sometimes in our own flesh that all is going to be well. Right? But we don't trust God's plan for that. We trust ourselves and our own planning and our own understanding. And then God shows us it means nothing. You always were a grasshopper. Why did you ever think you were tall in stature? You were some kind of giant anyway. It wasn't the size that was going to get you the victory. It was the God in heaven that was giving you the victory. It isn't how big you are. It's how big he is. It's never been about how big you are. It's always been about how big he is. And when you lose sight of that, God's going to remind you of that. He'll remind you of that real quick. Amen. Also, if you're here without Christ, you better remember one thing. 
Marvel not that the giants of this life will destroy you. There's one giant in the end that will destroy you, and that's the giant of death. See, every man has to answer to that thing of death. For as appointed a man wants to die, and after this to judgment. There's, there's going to be a time, man, woman, or child, that you're going to die. None of us, you know, I look at my dad, and he's 78 years old, and I, I realize, I think about that a lot, that God never promised me that I'm going to live 78 years. I have no idea how long I'm going to live, right? You look at some of your relatives, you think, well, man, they're living to be 80, 90 years old. Well, you may not get that long. We may not get that long, right? You may get longer. Who knows? But you know what? We can't assume any of those things. So what should we do? We should trust God every day of our life. And if you're not saved, you ought to trust God with your eternal soul right now. Amen. You ought to do that. If you've never come to Christ in saving faith and you never believed the gospel, you never repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ, then do it now. There ain't no reason to wait. Amen. You don't know when you're going to die. Oh, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to live a long time. When you're young, you always feel like you're going to live forever. Like you never feel like you're going to die. That's why you do really stupid things. Right? Because you, you're daring, right? You're a daredevil. You do like all kinds of crazy things, right? When you're young. And then when you get older, you're like, nah, that hurts. He's like, don't you want to do this? Nah, that hurts. Like Garrett wanted to eat hot chips and stuff. And he's like, you want one, Pastor? No, I don't want one of those. <laughs> Why? Because it hurts. I don't have to impress anybody anymore. I'm not young. I'm old. Nobody's impressing me. It don't matter. Right? I don't want that hurts. Right? So things hurt when you get older, right? You learn some things. When you're young, you get foolhardy and you do whatever you want. I'm not saying you're foolhardy if you eat hot chips. You can eat them all you want to, brother. I don't care. <laughs> eat them all you want to. Put them on video. Eat them. Give one to Joy. She'll get sick, though. Don't do that. No, I'm just kidding. We won't give you one of those, Joy. When we talked about giving you some food today, we didn't mean that. That'd be bad. Now, giving it to Jacob, that'd be all right. I'd enjoy that. But anyway... But if you're not saved, you ought, to look, you ought to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. You ought to look to heaven. Look to Jesus. Now, you have gi the giant of death is coming for you. It comes for all of us. And oh, to be able to look death in its face and say, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? We'll talk about that a little in the end. Amen. Right? You know, you may have decided to murmur against God and not accept His only begotten Son, but if you'll, if you'll turn to Him, you don't need to die in the wilderness. You don't need to die in hell. You may be born again and repent and believe the gospel. God is gracious. He's very merciful to save sinners. He, he not only saves them, He gives them His Spirit and He makes them new creatures. So they don't have to live a miserable existence on this earth as a lost, filthy, hell-bound sinner. Right? They don't have to live wickedly the rest of their life. They've been given the Holy Ghost of God to strengthen their hearts and to help them to, and to, help them to live this life for Christ. Amen? And you who are saved, God is not crushing you. God is not subverting you in your cause. Some of you think, look at God in heaven because you had a horrible father. Don't compare your father on this earth to your father in heaven. Don't do that. You may have had an awful father. You may have had an awful mother, but don't compare God in heaven to that because God is not like that. God is much, much more merciful than any father or mother you've ever had and gracious and loving and kind, right? So kind that he didn't ask you for anything. He gave you everything. Do you understand that? That's the difference. He didn't ask you for a thing. He gave you everything. He gave you his only begotten son, right? He gave you his darling boy. He gave you his, the, 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 the joy of his heart, right? He gave it to you. And what did man do? Killed him. Amen. They killed the prince of life, right? We did, right? But God was merciful to do that. God's merciful to the most wicked men on this earth. Today he feeds them. Today he clothes them. Today he, sh he lets the sun shine upon them. That is the merciful God in heaven. That's how merciful and loving he is. He is not like you. He's not fickle like you and I. If somebody offends us, we don't want to love them anymore. We are more apt to do things for people that we like than people we don't like. Correct? That's not how God is. God's totally different than that. In fact, you do a lot of things, and I do a lot of things that God doesn't like. And He's still loving and merciful to us. 
our attitude stinks sometimes. And God is still loving and kind and merciful to us, isn't he? He's not like us. If your attitude stinks and my attitude stinks, we just treat each other horribly, don't we? God doesn't do that, though. God treats you with love and kindness when you treat others with bitterness and wrath and anger and malice, right? Because something didn't go your way. That's not God. God's not fickle like that. That's not, God doesn't crush his, his children. He doesn't subvert them in, your, in their cause. Your cause is to live for Christ. That's why you were brought into this world. You were saved by grace so you could follow Christ and to be more like Jesus. So what does God not do? He doesn't subvert you in that. So if you have something in your mind to think, well, I'm going through all this stuff right now, and this must not be a trial of my faith. It must be God telling me I, I, I'm not his, I'm not real, I don't have any faith, and, and, and God is, is subverting me in that. No, that's not how God works. That isn't who God is. That's not his nature. His nature is very loving. And by the way, especially when you don't show him any love. When you don't talk to him because you've got other things to do. You're too busy to talk to God. You're too busy to hear from God. But he's never too busy for you. Is he? Never too busy for you. Number two, notice they didn't fight the giants right away. God knew not to give them giants right away to fight. And there are things in my Christian life, had I been given that fight right away, I would have been crushed by the weight of them. I would have probably walked away and quit, right? And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains. At that time, notice that phrase, at that time. What time? God's time. God's never early and he's never late. He's always right on time. Always. You that have seen God's hand move in your life and heart to meet, meet your every need and take care of you, has it not always been right on time? Has it not always been right on time? It was not right away. It was not as soon as they came into the land. The Lord waited and let them get many victories under their belt before he brought them to fight the sons of Anak. Remember, they were afraid. God knew their fears. And the same it is for you and I. Rest assured, all your trials come from God, and they come in His order and according to His mercy. They are specifically fit for you. I just can't believe that. I, I, I can't believe that. I know you have a heart of unbelief. I understand why you can't believe that. I just can't believe that God would really want me to go through this. Well, that's because you're not inherently holy, and neither am I. That's why we think that way. See, God is inherently holy. You don't think like God. God said, my thoughts are above your thoughts. My ways are above your ways. <laughs> of course you don't. From your vantage point, all you can see is bad things from it. Just like Jonah when he had to go to Nineveh. All he could see was the bad stuff. Right? I ain't going there. They killed my ancestors. Are you kidding me? I am going the other way. That way. Right? Why? Because they killed my ancestors. I can't see any good reason why to go witness to them. They were mean, nasty people. Mm -hmm. There is not one of your trials out of order. There is not one too soon or too late, but they are right on time. Right now you may be facing some big things, some mighty giants. They're big for you. And they seem to be at a difficult time in your life. And you wonder about the timing sometimes. But don't wonder about it. God knows at what time to give them. You look and you think, how in the world have I found myself in such trying times and strange things? But I'll remind you again, put you in remembrance of these things. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But you will. You, you will think it's strange. You will, in your mind, when you go through it, you'll be like, why is, this ha why is this happening now? Why does this have to happen now? Why do I have to go through this now? Why do I have to deal with this now? And it becomes strange to you. 
but it isn't strange. He said, Peter said, think it not strange that there's a fiery trial. I, I tell you, wouldn't it, don't you think it would be, well, you won't think this, but, but in maturity, you'll learn to think this, that it would be really a strange thing in itself to never have any trials at all. No fiery trial to try your faith. Lost people have no trials to try their faith. They have trials, but they have no trials to try their faith because they have nothing to try. <laughs> and everything doesn't work out for good for them because they don't love God and they're not called according to his purpose. Do you understand that? So you see like, you see bad things happen to them. You see things happen to them. You see all these different things and there's nothing good about it in that sense. Well, there isn't. Why? Because Christ isn't applied to it. But see, when Christ is applied to your trials, they are good. They do go to your good. By the way, I've watched what your trials do to you and, and what they do to me, and they humble us. They, they humble us. We're not so quick to bite people's heads off. We're not so quick to be impatient with people when God puts you through some affliction. And you think that affliction, well, that's an accident. No, it isn't. It's on purpose because you needed it. That's why he gave it to you. You can look back at things that happened and you can become so self-righteous, think, well, I walked with God, I was serving it. Yeah, but you still needed it. You still needed what God gave you. You still absolutely needed what God gave you. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gave it to you. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. And later on, Paul says, and again, I say rejoice. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You know what deep sorrow taught me? You know what deep sorrow and affliction and grief and pain and depression and, and that mental pain and grief and strife? You know what it taught me? It taught me to look at Jesus' life. And it taught me to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And to sit a little while with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It taught me to sit a little while with the man of sorrows. It taught me to go there and to learn of him and learn what my Lord went through and how he suffered for me and how he did all those things for me and how if God, got the, if God gave Christ the victory through it all, then he'll give me that same victory through it too. That he'll strengthen me through it. Right? Because he suffered, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's Jesus. How much more for you today, you spoiled brat? I know, that doesn't sound very nice, does it? But it's true about us, isn't it? How much more for you and I? that we should learn obedience by the things which we suffer. That's how it works in the Christian life. That's how it works when they face the giants. You know, Lee said something like this to me uh, when we were talking once about, about different things over the years. And he, and he, not once, he said it more than once, but we talked about that and he said, if it hurts bad enough, they'll do something about it. Right? Why? Because you learn through suffering. And when you're a Christian, you learn through suffering. You learn through suffering some things. You learn obedience. You learn what it means to obey God through suffering. Just like Jesus. Only he was perfect and without sin. He learned it for us. Is this too deep for you? Right? You and I do think it's strange, don't we? We think this does not apply to your, to your situation, right? That, the, that, that trying your faith sorely to make you question whether you ever even had any faith can't be for you. I'd be more worried if, I ne if my faith was never tried. I'd be very concerned with that. 
I'd be very concerned as a Christian to live this Christian life and never, ha- never question or have any trials to question my faith. Right? You say, but I, I, didn't, I didn't say you had to go through what your neighbor goes through. I, I didn't say that. Your trials are uniquely fitted for you, not for me. I can look at your trial and be like, what's the big deal? Cut it out, you big baby. Right? It's easy to do that, isn't it? Like a woman does when a man has an awful cold. She just looks at him and is like, what's wrong with you, baby? Get up. No, you don't have to lay on the couch for three days. You just have a cold. Get up. You're not dying. What, are you kidding me, woman? I'm dying! You got the sniffles. Get up. And no, none of your wives told me that. <laughs> I've been married for 20 years. <laughs> uh, I watch women do like crazy things through everything, like juggling like three babies and like Erica does sometimes. And um, Ryan doesn't do anything. And I mean, um, but, but uh, uh, he sits back with his feet up and like, look, bring me some iced tea, will you? I'm a little thirsty. <laughs> I'm kidding. Ryan does a lot. I'm just joking. But, but I see that, right? And then we have a cold, and it's like, lady, look, you don't understand. I got a cold. <laughs> well, can't you just get up and do something? Oh, really? I'm dying. <laughs> You're not dying. Get up. <laughs> Women who give birth, get up, get stuff done. It's like, what in the world? We're crying over a cold. That's how we are sometimes, though, right? You know, when God wants to bless his children, though, he greatly tries them. And sometimes God, before He blesses you, He tries you severely because He's going to bless you. I told you, I've looked at some of you and I've told you the situation you're in. There's a reason God is doing it. And God, in the end, God's going to bless you. But He's going to try you first because He has a reason. He has a purpose for what He's doing. God just doesn't the Bible says that he doesn't, he doesn't willingly afflict. Like, it's not like, oh, this is going to be fun. I think I'll, I think I'll afflict my children. Mm, come on. Right? You didn't, like, annoy God so he's ready to afflict you. Right? Like your earthly father when you annoy him and he wants to afflict you. Um, <laughs> right? Or flick you, one of the two. But, uh, <laughs> right? But that's, that's not how your heavenly father is. Like, you didn't wear out God's patience. You understand that? You can't wear out God's patience. Right. He'll wear out your hide before you wear out his patience. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. But God will try you before he blesses you. By the way, let me say this to you. There are things that God does not like, and he wishes you to rid them in this life. There's things about you that God doesn't like. There's things about me that God doesn't like, that he wants us to get the victory over. And he didn't show us those giants in the beginning of our race. They weren't, they weren't that prevalent in us, in that sense, to us, I should say. Because it was not his timing. And quite frankly, you, were, you and I weren't able to handle it. But there are things that people may have said to you or things and failures that God saw in your character flaws. And you were a baby and God doesn't crush babies. He gently nudges them, but now you as you get older, he'll not accept that out of you any longer. There are things that God won't accept. There are things that I know as a Christian uh, being saved for 20 years that God is, you're not going to ever do that again. (laughs) Never. You, You won't do that. So he allows things in your heart to be magnified. He's showing you your depravity. He shows you your level of unbelief and it's frightening to you. By the way, as a husband, he'll show you your failures as a husband. And he'll show you very plainly. As a mother, as a wife, he'll show you your failures. He'll bring to light those failures. Not in the honeymoon phase, though, Garrick. Not, not now. It's all, it's all perfect now. <laughs> all of it. Right? So don't, don't, just enjoy that time. It's... I won't ruin that for you. <laughs> Perfection for both of you. It's just, it's wonderful, right? 
But you know what? There, there comes a time when you learn as, as a husband and, a, and that you can't communicate the way you are. You can't overlook things that you've overlooked. Right? As a wife, the same thing. You, you can't walk around self-willed and do your own thing. Right? And, and have your kind of two lot. You know, I've seen Christian couples that are saved and I've watched them live in a house together, dwell in a house together, but going two separate ways. Like they don't work together. Right. Like they don't work together at all. They're just, pew. they're just kind of like doing their own thing. They're like roommates kind of, right? That sometimes share children. It's a terrible thing to watch. But as, as you grow and as you learn more and as the Bible is preached to you and as to whom much is given, much shall be required. And you learn, God expects more out of you. And as you grow as a Christian, God expects more out of you. Those giants now that are there, God says, now it's time to tackle those giants. Now it's time to fight them. It's time to fight the giant of self. It's time to do that. So he's allowing those things for you to see those things. You didn't know your unbelief could be so great. You didn't know it could be so big that your heart would be so full of unbelief. You didn't know that that, that level of unbelief is frightening to you. I'll tell you what, it was amazing to me when, when God allowed me to go through the things that I did. And I, I sat there and I, I looked at it. I was like, man, this is, whew. I mean... I can't believe how much unbelief is in my heart. I can't believe how much unbelief, right? Just say that. It sounds funny. Quit laughing at me. You'll say the same thing about you someday. <laughs> no, but you say, right? I can't believe it. Right. How much is in there? But then we overlook what the Bible warns us of. Yeah, come on. I believe, Lord. Help thou my unbelief. Right. There's a lot of unbelief in us, and it only takes the right trial to come along for that to boil up to the top. And for it to, and God's not boiling it up to the top to torture you with it. Now I'm going to show them the scum that they really are. That's not who God is. No, you know what God's saying? I'm going to boil that scum to the top so I can show you how I'm going to wipe it away. I'm going to burn off the dross. That's what God does to us. That's, see, I, I, listen, I don't know where you're going, but I know where I'm going. And where I'm going is to move on unto perfection of what the Lord has called me to do. Not to look back in the past, not to sit back in the past, but to face the giants and press forward. We have too much work to do, and we, don't have a, we, we are on a limited time of what we can do. So we have to keep pressing forward. I can't look back in the past. I can't, I, I, you know what's interesting to me? The other day, yesterday, uh, Friday, Hannah and I saw a couple that that we knew and loved dearly uh, for many years. I mean, for a lot of years. She's known him ever, for 25 years. We saw him out somewhere. I didn't see him. She did. And she just kind of waved. And they really didn't. Phew, they were gone. And, and, and I thought about that. And then that same day while that was going on, um, we had a few minutes and we were up there and we spent some time with Jessica up there. And I thought about that. How that's, that's part of our future. You know what I mean? That's, that's the present and the future is ministering to people that God has given us to minister to. And then I, I talked to, I counseled with uh, Carl and Mary on Friday as they were preparing for their wedding, which we did, by the way, on uh, um, Saturday morning, yesterday morning. So what a blessing that was. Very sweet little ceremony. It was a blessing. But, you know, we... Um, now, if I get a call from Croatia saying, why'd you do a wedding? I'll be like, none of your business. That's why. <laughs> Weddings are God's business, not yours. Amen. It's that old Baptist coming out, right? Hey, by the way, I listened to a sermon that I preached 19 years ago, and I was still preaching the same thing back then <laughs> about that. But uh, anyway, um, I got, I got a, Andrew's going to boost that audio. We're going to put that on. You're going to... Some of the things are a little, <laughs> but, but I was a new preacher, so I was always saved like for six months or something like that, I don't know, something like that. But anyway, but I thought about that in counseling them, how God said, you know, I don't want you to sorrow over the past. I want you to move forward. And th this is the future. This is, this is the future. This room is the future. 
you know, this is, this is the, the, the work. Amen? And I intend by the grace of God to finish my course and to keep the faith. Amen? See, I, I believe we're going somewhere. You know, I, I don't believe we're like stagnant sitting. No, we are moving and pressing toward the kingdom, pressing into the kingdom. That's what we're doing. I mean, we're, and the violent take it by force. And, and that, that's, that's the way that it is. So God is trying us through, through things. I spent five years of severe trials through things, but God had a reason for it. And he's going to show that in the, in the years to come. So, see, God allows those things to happen. So much so that you say, God, have I any faith at all? And you look in his word and it says, you have the faith of Christ. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. God shows us in his word, those that came to him. He says, yes, I saved you and washed you and I'm calling you to fight. And you have to fight the giants and you have to war against them. And they dwell in the mountaintops. And you have to kick them out of their high place and their lofty places. There are some things in you that God hates. There are some things in your flesh that you give in to and things that God hates. And God is saying, I'm going to use this trial to boil it out of you. Amen. That, that's, that's true Christian perfection. You see, that's what God wants. We're not talking about sinless perfection. We're talking about things that God perfects in us. That's what God wants. Like, there is a growing in grace. And you want it to be back like it used to be. And God says, no, you have to grow up. You know how you explain to that child that, well, you can't really do that anymore because you've got to grow up. I mean, you can't really do some of those things anymore. Right? I mean, I explain some of those things to Dave and Lee sometimes. You guys, you can't do that anymore. You got... <laughs> right? It's time to grow up. Amen. You don't get to be a Toys R Us kid anymore. <laughs> but you know something? That's, that's what God shows us. If God let your faith be stagnant and you continue, like there are people in churches today, and I'll tell you why, because most pastors aren't preaching that you're to move on to perfection, that you're to continue on in Christian maturity. That's what perfection means, by the way, to that Christian maturity, that they don't preach that. Like they're not going anywhere like that. Everything is whittled down to service and what you do but not growing you, not seeing you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Because you'll do the service and you'll do those things as you grow in the grace and knowledge. But you won't put an overemphasis on those things and then neglect your Christian growth. Because that's what I've seen. There's a lot of shallow preachers out there that they end up walking away from the pulpit, pastors that leave the ministry. Why? They had no depth to them. They weren't tried like that. And then when they were, they just walked away. And that's why we take heed, because it could be us. Amen. See, those giants in you, they dwell in the mountaintops. And God's ordered the fight for this time. And you have some experiences in fighting some things and getting victory over some things. And now you must grow in grace and in, in your warfare. And you're called, on, you're called to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, there's some things sometimes that God's going to ask you to do that you don't want to do. You just don't want to do them. God, I have my dreams. And I want what I want. And God says, but you're not your own. You're bought and paid for with a price. You, you don't get to do what you want to do. Oh, you can, and you can make a mess of things. But you need to do what I called you to do, what I commanded you to do. You need to follow me. There's some people that can never give up dreams to follow God and to be obedient to Him. They become very self-willed. It's easy to do. 
You're called to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ so that God has equipped you to fight giants, and that's why you have not fought them before because it wasn't time. But let me ask you a question. Has God made you sensitive the more to your own depravity? Has He shown you the giants in the land that have sat all the way at the top of the mountain? Things that rule you when you're to rule over them. Has God made you sensitive that? Showed you the more what's there. See, here's the thing. It's always been there. God just puts you into a place to be sensitive to it. Like there are things about your character. There are things about how you deal with others. There are things about how you, how you mother your children, how you father your children, how, you're, you're, how you are a husband to your wife, how you are a wife to your husband. There are th they've always been there. Like, those things have always been there. You couldn't see them. But now God reveals them to you. And you think, well, these things must be new or something must be really wrong. No, it's always been there. Now it's time to slay the giant. Do you see what I mean? Hus Here's an example of that. Husbands not leading their families, not leading their wives. You know, not leading the home, not, not doing that. That, if you haven't done that or you, you've allowed the wife to do that and you've not done what you're supposed to do, that's always been there. Now you just have the knowledge and the truth of it and God has made you sensitive to it. Now you have to deal with it. Or a wife not being submissive to her own husband and having a heart of rebellion. Yeah. Good. Hey. Right? Having that heart of rebellion like that, it's, it's a hidden rebellion that is there over leadership or children, the same thing. And you say, and you see it for the first time and it bothers you. God's magnified it. That's God bringing that giant up so you can slay it. Not to torture you with it. God wants you to root it out. He wants you to go to him for the strength and he wants it rooted out and he wants it changed. Let me, let me, let me help you with something. I do not believe in generational curses. Why? Well, be, because I'm a Christian, number one. And some people that hear that may not understand that, and that's okay. They'll figure it out when they get saved. But, but I, I believe what, what God says. I believe God, when the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. What I do understand, though, is that you can continue the same destructive patterns that your parents did. You can do that. And there are things that your parents got away with or that your parents did. They didn't get away with anything. But there are things that your parents did that God won't allow you to do. They're, like you, You're not allowed to do it. The mistakes that your parents made in marriage, the mistakes that your parents made in parenting, your parents should want you to do better than them. It's really a sad thing when a, when a parent looks at somebody and they say, well, I don't want to celebrate Halloween or I don't want to watch movies or I don't want to do these things. I don't want my kids to do these things. And the parents are like, well, you survived just fine. I didn't know we were supposed to survive. I thought we were to live the victorious Christian life. Right? Like, I don't want my children defiled by this world. You should, you should thank God for that. But you ought to check your spirit to find out why, why you hate that and get over yourself. Just because you made the mistake, you know, you can repent, ask God to forgive you, and you can say, I'm going to help my grandkids live for God. Amen. How about that? Right? Amen. Amen. Right. Wouldn't you want to do that? That's what I want to do. You know, your children are going to notice, as we have our children rise up and they get married, they're going to notice some of the mistakes we made. I pray to God they don't continue them. I pray to God they fix it in their marriages, in their homes, and they don't make some of the same mistakes that we did. Amen. That's what God wants. We've got to understand that. We've got to remember that. You're not chained to the past. You're not chained to those giants. See, maybe it's time. It's God's time to slay those giants that dwell there, even the sons of Anak. Number three, Joshua rid them in the mountains and in the cities. You may be assured that when God allows you to wage war with giants in your life, they'll be defeated.
God will not make something known to you to torture you with it, but to root it out and destroy it. You look at some of them and you feel as if you are a grasshopper in their sight as some of your trials and some of your failures in this life. That you're actively, some of the things that you know you have to get the victory over that you're not happy with. How you deal with your family, how you deal with your, your friends. By the way, you can make all the excuses you want, but they're just excuses. Amen. There is no excuse for you to be nasty with your family. You don't get to have an excuse for that. Amen. Amen. You don't get to have an excuse to bite people's heads off. You, you don't get to have that. Well, I'm going through this. Well, go through it on your own then. Shut your mouth. Nobody else should have to go through it. Why do they have to go through it? Because you are. Don't you love them enough not to make them go through it? Ooh. Ouch. You mean when I'm in a bad mood and not everyone has to know it? No, guess what, princess or prince? They don't have to know it. You can just shut your mouth, put a smile on your face, and say, thank God I'm not in hell. Amen. Like, people don't have to go through, through, through your wrath just because you're in a bad mood. Why should they? Why should they even know it? Well, I can't control it. Well, then I guess you better get God's help to do it then. I, bet, I guess you better trust the Lord to do it then. You don't have an excuse to treat people poorly. Right? You don't have an excuse to do that. You don't have an excuse to be bitey with people. God showed you that so you get the victory over it, not so you make excuses about it. I'll tell you what, if you take your afflictions and you make them excuses for sin, you are going to get in trouble. I'm, I'm, I'm going to warn you of something. If you take your afflictions and you make them excuses to sin, you do not know the depth of affliction that is headed your way. But it is massive. It is a deep ditch like a whore. And you will not climb out of it easy. God does not allow us to use our afflictions to make excuses. He says that your afflictions will, that he'll turn those into spiritual blessings and growth for us that we'll grow by them. Right? Just like Jesus suffered afflictions. And it taught him to obey in that sense. Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And at that time... Joshua, at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakids from the mountains, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. What is that? That's the promise of God. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our Joshua, our Jesus, would not start a work in you and not finish it. He didn't bring us to Canaan for us to be defeated or to conquer it. Our Joshua will, will go from the mountains to the cities to cut them off. The things that you have been most afraid of are the things that God will give you victory over in this Christian life. I mean that. The things that you are most afraid of are the things that God will teach you to have victory over. Mm -hmm. Now you don't get to sit around and be lazy and not fight. Well, I'm waiting for God to give me victory. That ain't how it works. The book of Joshua shows us man's personal responsibility and God's sovereignty all the way through it. Amen. That you have a responsibility. Amen. God will not rid your giants in the obscure places, but in the cities as well. He'll destroy them utterly. Think about the evolution of warfare, though. How we started, you and I, we started out in Egypt. We were in the world. We were saved from Egypt and brought to the borders of Canaan land. Now Abraham was promised the land of Egypt. It was granted to him, right? So Abraham had it by grant. But Abraham saw the land not, but he waited for the promise. And the promise is this Christian life. We wait on God for final victory in Canaan, but there is an acquisition. We've been granted, but we must fight. The violent take it by force. Every inch of spiritual ground will be taken by fight. The giants, they represented the dead. And so for the Christian, the last giant that you'll face is death. The last great and scary thing that you'll ever face is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end, 
when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. At the end of our lives, we will see that every one of Christ's promises were true, that he never left us, he never forsook us, he never abandoned us, and that all our enemies were defeated and we had victory given by God. And then Christ will give us that dying grace to slay the giant of death. We will say with the other saints, the Old Testament passage, Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Repented shall be hid from mine eyes. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? See, victory is certain for the child of God. Those giants will be slain. It's coming. We're promised it. Look, nothing failed that the Lord promised them. Circumstances may alarm you at times. Trials may press sore against the soul to tempt you to despair. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. When your mind and heart feel as if they are so overwhelmed that they would break, you ought to be able to say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Have you felt this way before? Have you experienced the wretchedness of your own flesh? The despair of warfare? Well, then you must have the same answer that the Apostle Paul had in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. See, that's the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the one that delivers from the body of this death. All around you is death. This world dies. You are dying. The moment you are born, you are dying. It, st it starts the countdown to your death. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land rested from the war. He took the whole land. I like these verses that talk about this. You and I will be able to say this at the end of our lives, the same thing. I like what this says. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Another verse says, And behold... This day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts, this is Joshua, by the way, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Not one of God's promises, not one has failed. He said in another place, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. Moses being a picture of Christ. Not one word failed. See, that's the faith that you and I have to exercise God hasn't, none of God's promises will fail. None of them. Everything that he promised you, he will keep. Everything. But God never promised you that you wouldn't have sorrow. In fact, he promised you sorrow. Sorrow is part of the curse. You are, it is appointed unto you to have sorrow. And if you live your life many years without that extreme sorrow, then you ought to be the more thankful to God that you spent that amount of time without extreme sorrow. 
You ought to thank God for every day that your heart was not filled with sorrow, because according to the curse, you should have been filled with sorrow constantly. But God gives grace. Doesn't give us what we deserve. Right? He said, I will multiply thy sorrow. But we have grace that is sufficient. Jesus was that picture, that proto-evangelium, right? That picture in the Old Testament of Jesus coming, that seed of the woman. And what did he say? He said, nevertheless, that they would have a child, that they would bring forth. And the seed of that woman would, would, would uh, give victory through that sorrow, right? That that fruit would bear the hope of a child and that life would come. That life would come. And, and by the way, through all of your sorrow, through everything you go through, God Almighty is still on the throne. Jesus is still, is still in the heart of the believer. He is still sanctified. He is still sealed off into the day of redemption, the soul of, of His people. And He has still given strength to them and joy, unspeakable and full of glory. There is still joy. There is still joy in all our trials. We still have reason for joy. We still have peace. We still have hope in that. Say, but I don't have perfect peace. Well, sometimes you won't because you're not looking for it in the right place. You're looking for it in your feelers. You're not looking for it in the truth. Peace comes in the truth. Victory comes in the truth. Peace doesn't come in the way you feel always. It comes in truth. To know the truth is peace. That's peace. That's comfort of the Holy Ghost. No matter what you go through, no matter what those giants are, I have no idea what each and every one of you are facing today. I have some idea what some of you are, but I don't know what it all is. But I know you're facing things that bother you. You're facing trials that, that press you sore. You're facing challenges that have come your way. And God's boiling that scum to the top to show you what's there, to lop off the giant's head. You have to have the courage to fight, to be strong and of good courage. Right? Just like no promise failed. Right? No promise failed. Right? Right? So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had sent unto Moses. Right? Nothing failed. God will not fail you. He never has and He never will. You may fail God, but He will not fail you. Amen. He has never failed and He will not. And whatever you're going through in this life right now, whatever your challenges are, whatever your burdens are, However weak you are, however feeble you are, however broken you are, you have to go to the Lord with it. You have to trust God with it. You can't neglect your walk with God and you can't neglect that devotion to God. You can't neglect studying the person of Christ and who He is through all your sorrows. If you would have the victory, you must have the devotion. If you lack devotion, you'll lack victory. If you lack instructions for your family, you'll lack the victory. That's just the truth, as it is plain and simple that God would have you to understand today. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your enduring truth. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your understanding and kindness and love toward us. Lord, we have many giants. Each person here has them. We have many giants we face. Lord, give us victory. Lord, give us strength. Lord, help us to walk with you. If there be one or two not saved here, Lord, convict their hearts of their lost and hell-bound wicked condition before you, that they've been wicked before you, that they've neglected you, that they've went their own way, and Lord, bring them to repentance and faith in Christ. But your children, Lord, that have come to you, that have acknowledged you as their Lord and Savior and trusted in you for everything, Lord, help them to trust you in this trial that they're in. Help them to be devoted to you. Help them to seek you in their afflictions. 
One of the ter most terrible things that we can do is to neglect God and seek other answers and not Christ. God, help us to draw close to you. Help us to make much about Jesus, the lover of our souls. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father in heaven. Please help us to love you more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.